I'll start by telling a story of these grants that I uh, put together. Um, and I can tell you it all started out by me being really stressed out about not knowing what I'm going to do because I'm starting a new job and I have to do something and it's not clear what that is. So I spent a lot of time last summer trying to come up with interesting project ideas, just doing a lot of brainstorming. And um, turns out one of the things that I think I found, I spent a lot of time brainstorming, I came up with a big list of projects and I was going to winnow it down to one or two that I wanted to do and turns out one or two is a few too few and I couldn't <laughs> get it down that far. Um, I got it down to like three or four. Um, and I, so then I started looking at, uh, one of the interesting things about most uh, funding sources is that there's a reason they exist. Um, and it's always important to remember that reason. So at the National Science Foundation, they have these call for proposals, uh, documents that come out on a regular basis that describe the various programs that they have. Um, and actually, one of the things about the National Science Foundation that most people don't know they're actually required by law to review every proposal they receive. Whether it's part of a program or not, whether it's within their scope or not, no matter what, they're required to take all of them seriously and review them no matter what. There's, I mean, if, as long as they're properly formatted and all the, like they, they follow the normal guidelines for a proposal, it doesn't, the topic matter is not, uh, never a legitimate reason to not review something. So you can submit any kind of proposal you want to NSF and they have to review it. Doesn't mean they have to fund it. Um, but so the, the programs they have are uh, kind of specific things that they really want to fund. So topics that they really like and they've assigned a pool of money to to fund. And those are really good to kind of figure out what those are. So one of the first things I did once I kind of had figured out some ideas that I wanted to do is I then went and read a bunch, a ton of these uh, call for proposals and program descriptions to try to figure out where my work might actually fit. I also read some from NIH, which my work didn't actually fit in, but I read a couple there and looked around for some other places. Um, and it turns out, unsurprisingly, none of them actually clearly fit in any of them, <laughs> uh, which was actually a really important lesson. Because uh, so one of the things I did is I started thinking, I started trying to adjust the projects to fit in with the goals of the program. So it was the thing that I really want to do, and then somewhat adjusted to fit in with the goals of the program, and that actually turned, be, turned out to be really val valuable because I think it actually made the projects better. Trying to think about, there's, a re there's usually a reason that these people want to fund work in a certain area, because this is a really interesting, valuable area, and trying to move it towards that area actually helped make the pro project stronger. So that was really valuable. And then I started about two months ahead of the deadline, I ended up writing up a one-page description of what the projects were going to be. So my first, the first one, the deadline was sometime in October. So just before the school year started in August, I sent in, I wrote up a one page kind of description of here's the idea of what I'm thinking about. Here's why I think it's interesting. Uh, but I, one, keeping it down to one page is really helpful. And I sent it in to, to one of the program officers and I said, I'm not sure which program this is, this is, would fit in well. Here's the ones I'm thinking of. What do you think? Um, and it, it was fortunate, I had, actually I hadn't met any of the program officers for that program before, so I just kind of picked one. And that person was actually on vacation, because this was August and everyone's on vacation in August. So they sent it on to another person, who was also on vacation. <laughs> so they sent it on to another person, who responded and said, actually, I'm the program officer in both of the programs that you're considering, so I will review this and get back to you. So that's the lucky part. Yeah, so that was the lucky part. I get it. I picked poorly initially, but because they were on vacation, it got funneled to the right person really quickly. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the program officers are the people, and there's usually a small group of program officers who are in charge of evaluating and, and running the program the, the, in that area. Um, so uh, I submitted it, I sent in the one pager, and about a week later, I got some feedback back, um, which for my specific question, which is which program should I submit this to, it was unhelpful. Their, their answer was, it fits both of them really well. <laughs> <laughs> so that was not helpful. Um, but is there, there was, a reason why you can't submit to two programs? You can't submit to two simultaneously. Oh. So, and the deadlines lined up in that, such that I wouldn't be able to submit them to both of them this year. If it got rejected from one, I could submit it to the other one the following year. And there would be no problem with that. But you can't submit more than one proposal. You can't submit the same idea to multiple pro programs at the NSF simultaneously. Um, 
So what was your feedback from that one pager? So the feedback was actually really good. The, both of the programs that I was looking at were interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary programs. Um, and basically, the feedback was, this is gonna be reviewed by people from both disciplines, so you need to make sure that, the, in this case, the research uh, needs to speak to, needs to be novel in both disciplines. So there has to be something in the project that's novel for both disciplines because of the way the interdisciplinary thing was set up. Um, and they actually, they told me, one of the things we try to do is we try to get, this was computer science and economics was one of them, the one that ended up funding it. And they said, we actually try to get real computer science per, uh, researchers and actual econ economics researchers both on the panel, and the, and we try to make sure that at least one from each side reviews every proposal, so that you actually have to be convincing to both groups in order to get funded by that program. And that was an intentional choice on their part, and they and they explicitly told me this, and they made some suggestions of ways that I could modify the, the project. Um, and that was really helpful. Um, so I did that for both of my projects, and I got helpful feedback from both of them. Um, then I spent, a lot of time writing. I went through a couple different uh, versions of the, of the proposal, basically from scratch. I kind of set aside an hour every morning. I'd get up and I'd write for an hour and then I would check my email for the first time and go on with the rest of the day. And that actually was really helpful at getting things done. Um, it I generated far more than 15 pages of text, but that was good. Um, and I tried to finish early so that I could share the proposal with others. I think actually you read one of them before I submitted it. And uh, I sent it around to a couple other people to try to get feedback. And that was actually really helpful also. And that helped kind of refine the ideas and uh, kind of see where I wasn't explaining things very clearly. And that was really helpful. So sharing proposals with others before you submit them I think was really valuable for me. Did you share it with the program officer? The actual proposal itself, no. I just shared the one pager. Because in some of the competitions, you, you can. Yes. Which is really helpful. Have you done that? Yeah. And you got a lot of good feedback that way? or I got a lot of good feedback. I didn't get the grant, but I got a lot of mm -hmm. good feedback. I mean, and the feedback was in the nature of, I mean, they won't tell you yes. that it's good or bad, but they will tell you, you know, you <coughs> didn't consider X. Mm -hmm. um, you, you haven't addressed why. Yes. Um, that type of thing. And, but you also, that also means that you have to be doing this. Um, I think the last time I, I, I did this, it said that your proposal had to, they had to have it a month before the deadline mm -hmm. in order to go through that feedback mm -hmm. process with you. Know, with you. So it may mean you need more than two months, maybe yes. you need three months or whatever yes. in terms of, of that. But just like with your one-page pre-proposal, um, that's really, I think, a really helpful thing. Yes, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, structure, because the program officers, they, they make the final decisions on who gets funded, but they don't provide quality input. So the program officers aren't the ones deciding what are the high quality proposals. There's a panel of experts that they bring in that do that. And then the program officer's job is to use that quality feedback to produce a set of proposals that are going to get funded. And the program officers are the ones that do the other, the other criteria that the NSF cares about, like spreading the money out across multiple universities so all money doesn't go to the same place. And supporting new uh, new investigators in addition to established people and those other kind of criterion, mm -hmm. that's the program officer's job, but their job is not to evaluate the quality of the, of the project and the work, which is one of the reasons they can't say this is good or not, because that's actually not their job. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was, that's really interesting is uh, the one pager turns, I, I forget where I got that advice and I did it, but I found out since then, one of the things that's really interesting is the entire structure of the NSF and all of the program officers are designed to read, are designed around one page documents. So basically, uh, the summary page on a proposal is one page. If you send them a one page, they read it. That's what they do. They read thousands of these a month. And they're really good at reading one page documents. So program officers, that's basically their stock and trade. They hand around and read one page documents all day. That's what they do every day. 
So that's the way, that's the best way to actually communicate with them because it fits into their workflow really well if you have a one page document. What uh, in that one page that you submitted or that you'd recommend for others to submit? Mm -hmm. That's not, a, I presume it's single space, <laughs> but what, yeah. what, what, uh, what would you have people really emphasize on that one page? The novelty or the interdisciplinary aspect or a hypothesis or what, what would you suggest is the, uh, the best thing to communicate given that kind of space? So it depends on the kind of feedback. I would, I would structure the one page around the feedback that I needed. So in my case, I wanted to know, I had to describe the project and why it was interesting in enough detail because I wanted to know which, pro which program to submit to. And mm -hmm. They said both, which is, I guess, helpful in some way and not helpful in another. Um, so that was one thing. Because um, the, the goal of that is not to actually have them evaluate your work. It's to give feedback and help you. Mm -hmm. So if you can kind of emphasize the parts that you, you think you need help on, that's where, the, that could, that's where they can help. So if there's things you're not sure about, if you're not sure if these hypotheses are appropriate for that program, mm -hmm. That's what you should focus on if you're not sure that the okay. project idea is overall. No, that, I beg your pardon. What I was thinking of is if you're submitting a full proposal mm -hmm. and you mention something about one page in that context, mm -hmm. that one page is a description or something yes. that, that's, that leads the other 14 pages. Yes. And, I, and that's the page I was really asking okay. about, so given the, the fact that that's the one that, they, that, 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 that gets them... The, the most intense, or at least the, the earliest attention? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would focus on, so uh, that's hard to tell. I, okay. I haven't seen from the inside, so I don't have a, a lot of feedback on that. So I guess that was my first story about the proposals. And then uh, two of the ones that I submitted were accepted for funding and one of them was not. The most frustrating thing is actually this like six month wait while you find it, while you hear, don't hear back. Everyone who submitted proposals around the room is going, yes, that is so frustrating. Um, it is, it's very frustrating, but it's really cool when, they, when you get the email and they say, we'd like to recommend this reward. Um, mm -hmm. could, could you give us a very brief sense of what your projects were and also how you would change them to, to better fit with the programs? Sure. Uh, so one of the projects is looking at this idea of crowdfunding, where you can have a, a website where people can propose projects that uh, say, I need $1,000 to do this project, and then any, lots of other people can come <coughs> and donate to that project. And I've, I found one of the things, uh, one of the things that, uh, concepts that actually helps, that drives the NSF that I found to be really useful is this idea of pastor's quadrant. Has anyone heard of this? It's a really interesting idea from, I can't remember what, what his name was in the early 50s that was very influential at the National Science Foundation. Um, the idea is, if you look at research, the people used to categorize things as basic research or applied research. His idea is that that's not actually two ends of a continuum, but actually two dimensions. So you can have research that contributes to our kind of <coughs> fundamental generalizable knowledge, and you can have research that applies to uh, that applies to real world problems. And those are actually two different dimensions. So he used the example of, uh, let's see, Niels Bohr, he studied the atom, he contributed a lot to our generalizable knowledge, but nothing he did was actually very practical in the real world. And uh, Thomas Edison did a lot really of, of kind of applied, really practical work, but didn't really contribute a lot to generalizable knowledge, it turns out. Uh, but then he used the example of Louis Pasteur, who did a really great job of doing both at the same time. He uh, contributed to our generalizable knowledge, kind of discovered microbes, which is really important, and he had in, in doing that same project, he was able to discover pasteurization and how to like save us from a lot of these microbes. So, uh, which is a very applied problem. So, the same project can be both have strong kind of general knowledge and strong applications. So, one of the things that uh, my work has been doing is trying to look at that. So, the kind of general knowledge, uh, I looked at um, the structure of these websites, and actually, the problem is that uh, there's a really interesting problem on these crowdfunding systems about how people, uh, what's a good way to describe this? It's the problem of what I call complementarities. Basically that my money's not enough to fund a project and your money's not enough to fund a project, but if we both contribute together, then it is. 
type thing. So, but I might wait for you to contribute before I do. A lot of people seem to wait until it's mostly funded before they're willing to contribute. And if lots of people do that, then you end up with projects that aren't getting funded even though they should be because people want to <coughs> contribute to them. Um, so that's the basic kind of general problem. And it turns out there's a ver it's a very similar problem to a lot in lots of kind of matching situations. If you're trying to put a, together, a, like hire a team of people, and you need, I don't know, if you're for use a football analogy, if you need a quarterback and a wide receiver, if you don't have one, then the other one's kind of worthless. So, uh, but you can't just hire one hoping to get the other. You need to hire them both together. So that's the same kind of situation. Um, so that's kind of the generalizable knowledge part, and then the actual crowdfunding application, and how uh, it's being used a lot in journalism, and how this is kind of really interesting potential new funding source for journalism is a very strong application. So I like this project because it was very firmly in the pastoral quadrant area. Um, one of the feedback I got is basically that sounds a lot like a really interesting economics project but it's not contributing much to computer science. It's using computer science because it's, it's enabled by kind of computing technology and the internet but it's not contributing new research to computer science. So um, I'm trying to remember what some of the suggestions they gave me were. Um, they, well, they actually suggested things that wouldn't count as new research in computer science. So if I use simulations to try to, to model behavior, that is not considered computer science research. So they, they said that would not be a good addition. Um, what I ended up doing was uh, looking, thinking about if this is a matching problem, we're trying to match people with people with projects with people with money. Um, the way matching works in computer science is they have recommender systems that recommend who's doing what. Um, and so I looked at, I tried to look at the same problem from the kind of computer science point of view, and it turns out they also don't know how to deal with this complementarity issue either. So I added a section of the proposal where I was going to work on that. And I, uh, it turns out I have some background in recommender systems, so I was able to be convincing in that also. So that was the way I modified that project. That's their concern that it wasn't enough computer science research is I added a piece of, uh, piece of the project, and it turns out actually then there was actually added two pieces of the project because there was a third piece that was really interesting how they, if, you if we actually solve the economics problem and solve the computer science problem, using them together will actually then cause new problems. And so the third piece of the project was how's that, how, how that's going to be. So that actually would be following their suggestion and trying to find this new combination actually proved to be really in interesting intellectually. Um, does that help? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So that was kind of some of the ways that I thought about modifying things. And that's why it's helpful to do this months in advance, because it takes a while to kind of put the ideas together and uh, figure that out. Um, that so. Pastor's Quadrant is a really interesting mm -hmm. one. It is. I think uh, that'll, I'll try to go back to what I'm doing and uh, <laughs> strengthen that aspect, because it's uh, It'd be kind of fun to do all that. Too. Yes, it's it's a really interesting way to think about things, and it turns out, especially for the National Science Foundation, the, the guy who wrote it, I want to say his name is Donald Stokes, but I could be wrong, uh, actually wrote it with the NSF as its intended audience. He was trying to make an argument that the NSF should focus on this type of work, that they should, because at the time there was a lot of discussion: should we be focusing on basic research or applied mm -hmm. research? Mm -hmm. And his and his argument was. That's the wrong discussion to be having. We should be focusing on more research that does both. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was very influential and has been uh, kind of codified into, I mean, that's why the NSF has the two uh, review criterion. So does everyone, does everyone remember or heard of the two review criterion for the NSF? The intellectual merit and broader impact, which are kind of exactly those two mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dimensions, and they demand both. And, that, and that's kind of the reason why uh, was because of this idea of Pastor Squadron. Yeah.